in grace and in the knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. To him be glory both now and forever. Now, growing has to do with glorifying God. And uh, the key is the Bible. Uh, you're not going to grow without being involved with your Bible. The purpose is to glorify God. And uh, we've seen some of the keys already. Um, it makes sense that if we're going to grow by the Bible, we've got to obey it, don't we? Obedience. Now, we have to not only see what God says. He says, be doers of the word, not hearers only. Now, the filling of the Spirit. And God's Holy Spirit is the one who will help us to understand his word and to obey his word. And then we looked at confessing sin. Sin is what will keep us from growing. Boy, you know, we can come up with a hundred different excuses, can't we, as to why we have to not obey the Lord and why, why sin is okay for us and not for somebody else. But God says confess it and forsake it. Well, today we're going to look at another key, and that's, that's the subject of love. And you're not going to grow without loving the Lord and, and loving others. And Matthew chapter 22, verse 35, Jesus speaks on this subject. Matthew 22, verse 35. Then one of them, which was a lawyer, asked him a question, tempting him and saying, Master, which is the great commandment in the law? Jesus said unto him, Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart and with all thy soul and with all thy mind. This is the first and great commandment. And the second is like unto it, thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. On these two commandments hang all the law and the prophets. Well, that's, that's a pretty plain statement, isn't it? You know, you, as you read the Gospels, you'll see they often tried to ask Jesus questions. And, and it, it says they, they got to a point where they decided we better not do that anymore. <laughs> Jesus always had exactly the right answer. I wish I always did, but uh, the Lord did. You know, loving God is such an important part of our life and then loving others. And we're going to illustrate that tonight. We're going to learn about it uh, through the life of Peter in John chapter 21. So if you'll turn to John chapter 21, I'm just going to, we're going to work our way through some of these verses and uh, just uh, try and get some insight into this. John chapter 21. Just right at the beginning of the chapter there. This is after Jesus has died on the cross. He's been buried. He's risen from the dead. He's, uh, he's talked to several people uh, and uh, appeared to the disciples. And then in um, verse 1, it says, After these things, Jesus showed himself again to the disciples at the Sea of Tiberias. And on this wise showed he himself. There were together Simon Peter and Thomas, called Didymus, and Nathaniel of Cana and Galilee, and the sons of Zebedee and two other of his disciples. Now, by my reckoning, I count seven there. Simon Peter saith unto them, I go a fishing. They, they say unto him, We also go with thee. They went forth and entered into a ship immediately, and that night they caught nothing. We we'll just stop reading there. Um, so here's these seven former disciples, and uh, they're discouraged. They're unhappy, I'm whatever. And when Peter says, I go a fishing, uh, the, the thrust of the words there is, I'm done with what I've been doing. I'm going back to what I used, what I know, fishing. I'm tired of this disciple, disciple stuff. And he not only uh, leaves the ministry, he leads six others to go with him. And, and they were happy to be led. We're, we're going to. And they immediately enter into a business failure. <laughs> They, they went out fishing, and they caught nothing. Uh, verse 4. But when the morning was now come, Jesus stood on the shore. But the disciples knew not that it was Jesus. Then Jesus saith unto them, Children, have ye any meat? They answered him, No. Now, let me just pause there. Don't you hate it when you're fishing, and you haven't caught anything, and somebody says, Have you caught anything? <laughs> it's a fisherman's... Worst question, no. I'm, I'm sure they didn't even answer him very nicely. No. And he said unto them, Cast the net on the right side of the ship, and ye shall find. They cast therefore, and now they were not able to draw it for the multitude of fishes. So they weren't fishing with a, a rod and line like, like I kind of picture, but uh, they were using, using nets. And uh, at Jesus' command, they had business success. Now, 
Do you think Jesus gave them that success to keep them in the fishing business? <laughs> I don't think so. And yet how often do we, you know, we have some success and we think, oh, yeah, you know, this is the way the Lord's leading me. Uh, who knows what all the Lord was showing them, showing them that it pays to obey him. Uh, to assure them that he'd supply them. But understand, at that point, they didn't actually know it was Jesus. Uh, I think one of the things is he's showing them who he is. Notice in verse 7, Therefore, you know, because of what happened, therefore that disciple whom Jesus loved saith unto Peter, It is the Lord. From that, he, that's the Lord. Uh, we, we sing a song in our, our hymnal, It's just like Jesus. It's just like Jesus. Well, that, that's exactly what John saw. That's the Lord. That's just like what Jesus would do. <laughs> I guess they'd had that happen before. Uh, and let me just say this. Don't let business success draw you away from God's business. Uh, we've got a little boy who sometimes comes to Sunday school, but lately he's been mowing yards. Well, it just so happens that quite often he has to mow a yard at 10 in, on Sunday morning. And, you know, I say to him, listen, you know, put God first. And, but, you know, uh, so often we put money before God. And uh, we need to be careful. Don't let business success draw you away from God's business. Matthew 6, he says, Seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto you. And we think, oh, I've got to work for things. I've got to work. Well, you've got to trust the Lord. Then let's, let's read on. Verse uh, 7, he said, It is the Lord. Now when Simon Peter heard that, heard that it was the Lord, he girded his fisher's coat unto him, for he was naked, and did cast himself into the sea. I don't, can't say I understand it physically how all that works, but anyway. And the other disciples came in a little ship, for they were not far from land, but as it were 200 cubits, dragging the net with fishes. And as soon as they were come to land, they saw a fire of coals there, and fish laid thereon and bread. Jesus saith unto them, Bring of the fish which ye have now caught. Simon Peter went up and drew the net to land full of great fishes, an hundred and fifty and three. And for all there were so many, yet was not the net broken. Jesus saith unto them, Come and dine. And none of the disciples durst ask him, Who art thou, knowing that it was the Lord? Yeah, as, they, as, as they came to Jesus there, you probably had that happen. Where you, you're pretty sure it's somebody, but you're, you're not. You know, it's such a different situation. Um, they, they knew it was the Lord. And Jesus feeds and warms them. And one of the things I noticed is he didn't start by talking to them. He didn't give them a lecture. He didn't say, now sit down, let me talk to you boys. Uh, he, he said, come and dine. You know, he, he fed them, he warmed them, uh, he, he helped them first. And then Jesus begins to speak to the leader. Let, let me say this before I go on. Let's see, in verse 9 there, uh, they saw a fire of coals. Now, just a few chapters before, we see a fire of coals. Do you remember where it was? It was as Jesus was being tried and Peter was denying the Lord. It's exactly the same expression that he uses. That uh, I think it's uh, John 18, verse 18. The, the servant and officer stood there who'd made a fire of coals. And, you know, Jesus, I think, is taking Peter through something to counteract what he'd done before. Now, you can disagree with me on that. But here's, here's a fire of coals. There was a fire of coals. There he denies the Lord three times. Here the Lord is going to ask him three times, Peter, do you love me? And, you know, the Lord is, is very gracious and, and kind, but he needed Peter to see something. And uh, he, he speaks to Peter as the leader. Verse 15. So when they had dined, Jesus saith to Simon Peter, Simon, son of Jonas, lovest thou me more than these? He, that's Peter, saith unto him, Yea, Lord, thou knowest that I love thee. He saith unto him, Feed my lambs. Uh, most of you have heard this before, but it's true. I checked it again today. Uh, in, in Greek, they have more words for love than we do. You know, we, we love pizza and we love our wife, you know, and we, we love our country. And yeah, yeah, There's different meanings to, to those. But when Jesus asked Peter, Do you love me? It's the same word that God uses in John 3.16. It's agape. Peter, do you love me? God so loved the world. You know, sacrificial, committed love. And, and Peter's answer is in stark contrast uh, when, you, when you go into the, to the language. When he says, yea, Lord, thou knowest that I love thee, it's the word phileo. Now, uh, that, that's the word for uh, 
friendly affection. Uh, maybe some of you have experienced this where you're, you think there's a, a, a relationship developing and uh, you say to your girlfriend, I love you. And she says back to you, I think we should be friends. <laughs> That's, that wasn't what you meant. That wasn't the relationship you're looking for. <laughs> Um, and that's exactly what, what's happening here between Peter and Jesus. Jesus is saying, Peter, do you love me? Peter says, I really like you, Lord. And you know, as you, as you think about that, um, Jesus asked him this uh, more, than, more than once. In fact, let, let me read on verse 16. He saith to him again the, the second time, Simon, son of Jonas, lovest thou me? He saith unto him, Yea, Lord, thou knowest that I love thee. And again, it's the same, same words, love and, and friendship. He saith unto him, Feed my sheep. He saith unto him the third time, Simon, son of Jonas, lovest thou me? Peter was grieved because he said unto him the third time, Lovest thou me? And the third time when Jesus asked him, he uses the same word Peter used. He said, Peter, do you, do you like me? Peter, are you, are you even my friend? And he said unto him, Lord, thou knowest all things. Thou knowest that I love thee. Jesus saith unto him, feed my sheep. And let me say to you this evening, God, Jesus wants more than a friendship with you. God doesn't just want to be your mate. God wants you to love him like he loves you. He wants, you, he wants the kind of love that God showed at Calvary. God so loved the world that he gave his, his only begotten son. Uh, you know, phileo love is good. I mean, there's nothing wrong with that. There's lots of people that, that that's my relationship to them, and that's okay. But uh, it's not enough in your relationship with the Lord. Uh, Christ wants, wants more than, than your friendship. And he, he points out some qualities here that are part of our love for him. In, uh, in verse 18, this is an amazing verse as Jesus tells Peter the future. Verily, verily, I say unto thee, when thou wast young, thou girdest thyself and walkest whither thou wouldst. But when thou shalt be old, thou shalt stretch forth thy hands and another shall gird thee and carry thee whither thou wouldst not. And John explains, this spake he signifying by what death he should glorify God. And when he had spoken this, he saith unto him, follow me. Now in those verses, you see a couple of, of qualities of God's love for us and, and our love for the Lord. And, and the first one is sacrifice. Now, Peter had said before, let, let me see if I can find this. Um, I think it's Matthew 26. Let, let me just read it for you here. Do you remember when... Uh, uh, Peter had, had said, uh, although all men shall be offended because of thee, yet will I never be offended. And Jesus said to him, this night before the cock crow thou shalt deny me thrice. Peter said unto him, though I, uh, though I should die with thee, yet will I not deny thee. And, and note as well, this is Matthew 26, uh, 35. Likewise also said all the disciples. You know, they, they echoed what, what Peter had said. You know, Peter had said, Jesus, I'll never deny you. Oh, I would die for you. And now Jesus is letting him know that, yes, he will. He, he would sacrifice his, his life for the Lord. You know, God wants us to have the attitude that our life is, is his to command. Uh, in, uh, you know, as we read there in, in, in Matthew, uh, Matthew 22 and, and verse 37, when, when we started, uh, thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart and with all thy soul and with all thy mind. We need to be willing to put God first. Colossians 1 says that in all things, he might have the preeminence. You know, God doesn't want to just be a part of your life. God wants to be your life. God, wants to, to, God loves you and wants you to love him in return. In fact, he says we love him because he first loved us. And this is not a sentimental, emotional love. This is not a, a, a feeling. Now, this is a love willing to die for the Lord. Now, you know, oftentimes as Christians, we, we sing and, and we say that we love the Lord. And then on the other hand, we won't obey him or, or serve him. I think there's many people who love the Lord with a phileo love. 
with a, a friendship. You know, they, they have a fondness for God because of, he's been good to them. And I found those same people quite often will turn on the Lord when things aren't so good. Because it's, it's, a, it's, a, friend, it's, a, it's a skin kind of love. It's a feel-good kind of love. One man wrote a book about a Christian's relationship to his church. And the original title was something like, Stop Dating the Church. <laughs> you know, a lot of people have the attitude that it's kind of like they're dating God. Well, yeah, we'll go out, you know, yeah, I'll go out Sunday at 10. Yeah, maybe I'll see him, you know, call him a little bit. God, God, that's not the kind of relationship God wants. God wants a, a committed sacrifice. Um, you know, as, as Christians, we need to be uh, willing to, to give ourselves to and, and for the Lord. And Jesus there in, in John was showing Peter that someday he would love totally. Uh, what he had said and failed before, oh, I would die for you. And he was showing him that someday that would become a reality. And for many of the disciples, that was the truth. And you know, there's still Christians today. Uh, we don't hear about it much in our liberal uh, uh, reporting that we hear, but there's people who are killed every day because they love the Lord. Ten of the disciples were killed for the cause of Christ. Uh, our love requires sacrifice. And you know, love, real love requires sacrifice. A second one that we read there in verse 19, Jesus said to him, follow me. Obedience. Real love to the Lord requires obedience. Uh, that's doing right even when we don't feel like it. You know, just, just loving the Lord. In uh, 1 John 2 and, and verse 5, Here. The book of 1 John gives us a lot of truths about the reality of being a Christian. And 1 John 2, 5 says, Whoso keepeth his, his word, you know, God's word, in him verily is the love of God perfected. Hereby know we that we are in him. 1 John 2, 5. You know, obeying the Lord is, is part of our, our love for him. Now, for many Christians, Christianity is a relationship of convenience. I'll obey the Lord if it's convenient. Agape love for God requires sacrificial obedience. Uh, John 15, verse 13, just a few pages back there from John 21, Jesus is speaking. He says, Howbeit when he, the spirit of truth, has come, I'm sorry, that's chapter 16, verse, chapter 15, verse 13, greater love hath no man than this, that a man lay down his life for his friends. Ye are my friends, if you do whatsoever I command you. See, he relates love and obedience. Uh, God wants our love to be sacrificial obedience. God wants us to love him. God also wants us to love others. Do you remember as we read there in Matthew uh, 22, he says the second commandment's like it. You know, first, love the Lord your God. The second, love others. Now, there's a, a verse in 1 Peter. You can look there if you want. 1 Peter 1 and verse 22. It's talking about our, our, our Christianity when he says, Seeing ye have purified your souls in obeying the truth through the Spirit, unto unfeigned love of the brethren. You know, when you get saved, it leads you to have a love for other Christians. I've, I've often heard people say that. You know, before they were saved, they could have cared less you know, about other people. But God gave them a love for people, for the lost and, and for Christians. Unfeigned love of the brethren. He says, see that you love one another with a pure heart fervently. God wants us to love each other. Uh, this, this is not just a casual statement God's making there. It's important, our relationships uh, to each other. Loving others. You know, I, I find it interesting that, yeah, we're, we're a pretty small church. I've been in big churches, and uh, this, is, this is not a big church. And yet there's, there's people here who, who don't even know each other's names. Oh, you know, that, you know, get to know each other. And, you know, if you're going to love someone, at least know their name. And, uh, you know, that way you can, you can pray for them. And you'll find if you pray for them, you'll, you'll learn their name. You know, in one sense, it's easy to love the whole world. Oh, I just love the whole world. It's the individuals that are trouble. <laughs> God, God wants us to love the individuals. Uh, we need to have a general, you know, love for the lost and love for, for God's, God's people and so on. But... It needs to be translated into specific relationships. And you're not always going to feel like loving. You know, love is not a feeling. But you can always love by deeds and by service. 
Now, love is not a feeling, it's an action. If, if you're still there in, in 1 John, 1 John 3, uh, verse 16, one of the main themes of 1 John is love. And he says in 1 John 3, 16, Hereby perceive we the love of God, because he laid down his life for us, and we ought to lay down our lives for the brethren. But whoso hath this world's good, and seeth his brother have need, and shutteth up his bowels of compassion from him, how dwelleth the love of God in him? My little children, let us not love in word, neither in tongue, but in deed and in truth. See, it's easy to say, oh, I love you. I've said this before. You know, sometimes you're watching TV, and somebody on that TV screen will say, on that TV screen will say, I love you. <laughs> you know, some politician or some actor or something. I love you. I think, you don't either. Uh, you know, it's easy to say to nobody, I love you. Now, God says it's, it's not just in, um, in verse 18, not just in word or in tongue, but in deed and in truth. And, you know, that's the way God loves us. He doesn't just say it. He showed it. You know, God commendeth his love. That means he showed his love toward us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. God loved us in our sin. There's a, I think it's in Jeremiah where it talks about, and I can't remember the exact words, but it, it just talks about a, a person in there, their filth, and, and God just loves them and, and helps them and, and cleans them up. In, in John chapter 13 is when Jesus washed the, the feet of the disciples. And, and you see the example of his love here because, you know, first he showed his love, then he said his love. Let me read it. John 13, verse 3. Jesus, knowing that the Father had given all things into his hands and that he was come from God and went to God, he riseth from supper and laid aside his garments and took a towel and girded himself. After that, he poureth water into a basin and began to wash the disciples' feet and to, wash, to wipe them with the towel wherewith he was girded. So he just begins to wash their feet. They, they don't understand what he's doing. They, you know, Peter's questioning it and so on. But then later on, in verse 34, 34, he says, A new commandment I give unto you, that you love one another. As I have loved you, that ye love one another. By this shall all men know that ye are my disciples, if ye have love one to another. It's not enough just to say to each other, I love you. Love you, brother. <laughs> we need to show it. We need to, it needs to be real. In uh, 1 John 3, 16, we read, Hereby perceive we the love of God, because he laid down his life for us, and we ought to lay down our lives for the brethren. That, that means sometimes we're going to spend time that is going to be a sacrifice because we love someone. Uh, we're going to give up something because we, we love someone. We're going to inconvenience ourselves because we, we love someone. Jesus showed his love, and he wants, us to, he wants that to be true of, of us as well. You know, church is not just something we attend. Uh, it, it's, a, it's a body. And we need to, to be careful that we're, uh, we're doing what, what God wants us to do. If we're going to grow as Christians, love is a part of it. It starts with love for God. And uh, as you love him, you'll, you'll read his word. You'll want to obey him. Uh, you'll want his Holy Spirit to help you. And he'll help you to love others. Yeah, he'll, he'll help you with that. It, it's not... It's not that hard. Salvation is the beginning of a love relationship with God. And then God wants you, uh, your love to grow and, and to mature. Uh, you won't grow spiritually without love. Godly, real love. Let, let me ask you tonight, has it started? <laughs> Are you saved? Do you know Jesus Christ is your Savior? And then secondly, has it grown? You know, when you, you first become a Christian, everything's new and, you know, there's, it's kind of different, but... Then you get down to the nitty-gritty. You actually get to know those people that you're going to church with, and you find out, oh, horror of horrors, even the preacher has flaws and sometimes says and does and is the wrong thing. Yeah, you get to know people, and then you got to really love them. Not just a friendly love, but a sacrificial, committed love. Uh, do you love God or just what he can do for you? There's plenty of people who are glad to have God do good things for them. But when God says, lovest thou me more than these, one, I believe what he was saying there is, 
You know, Peter, before you said, though everyone else denies you, I won't. He said, Peter, do you really think you love me more than these other men do? See, we're all on the same boat. <laughs> we're all the same before the Lord. And we need to be careful that we don't, you know, it's easy to condemn someone else. That's what Peter was doing. Oh, if they might, they might betray the Lord. I never will. Peter, do you love me more than these? Well, well I really like you, Lord. I think Peter was to a point where he was afraid to commit himself because he thought, oh, I've, I've failed before. And yet God used him. And God brought him to a, a love relationship. And God, you know, when you get into the book of Acts, Peter's the one that God uses up there speaking and preaching and people uh, responding. He's the, one of the main apostles. Do you love the Lord or just what he can do for you? Let me encourage you. God loves you. The, the one who knows you best loves you the most. Now, there's probably things about each one of us that if, if we knew about each other, we'd, we'd be suspicious, you know. But God knows, and he loves you, and he paid for that sin. We're going to go in our songbooks to page 215, My Jesus, I Love Thee. Now, that's a, a prayer. That's a, a commitment, really. And uh, as we say, maybe, maybe you need to do some business with the Lord and uh, just get some, some things right with him. Or maybe there's people that you need to get things right with. You can't be right with God and wrong with people. What did I say? Page 215. I'll, I'll just leave that, that song. Let's stand.